there's a there's a common theme I hear about it from affluent people that got okay. me to that point. You see, okay. the affluent people, they 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 get a squeaky wheel on a wheelbarrow, and the the normal person, the unsuccessful mind, straight away goes to the wheel and goes, "Well, I've got to grease it. You know, I've got to repair that wheel." Okay, the successful person turns around and says, "When was the last time I used the wheelbarrow?" Do I need that wheelbarrow? Does that wheelbarrow need to be here? Is it more cost effective to actually employ someone at the time to come in and do the work? So I've now got him and his wheelbarrow. Why is the problem there? Let's look at that first before we start fixing something. The amount of people that actually have things in their house that they fixed and still never used it. <laughs> so successful people, they focus on the problem rather than the solution and first ask themselves what is the problem there in the first place it's summer which means you're going to be outside having fun and you need cool comfy t-shirts that represent who you are head over to inspired tees company at my shopify and you'll find the perfect inspirational christian tees for you inspired tees also has unique jewelry coffee mugs pharmacy cosmetics and skincare, and more everything you and your family need for an amazing summer at inspired tees company Shop online right now at inspiredteasco.myshopify.com. Steve, you're an entrepreneur, author, speaker, coach, known as the real life Wizard of Oz. You're also an awesome podcast host, much, much more. Thank you for your time, man, and joining me today. I appreciate it. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's go back a bit, man. I mean, you helped your family lay in bricks as a kid, but you know, where did you grow up? What was childhood like for you? It was like every other entrepreneur. Um, you know, it, I, I grew up with no money, uh, thinking I was poor, but aggravated. Uh, I grew up in East London. Okay. As you mentioned, my father had a construction firm, which consisted of him, uh, his brother, my uncle, my cousins, my granddad. So it was a real family little tribe. Um, but I grew up thinking, is this it? You know, is, is this my life? And of course, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, we didn't have social platforms to show us how inadequate our lives were. So it was just a gut reaction that there's got to be something better for me. So I went out to try and find it. And of course, along that way, found a ton of jobs that I was ill qualified to do, <laughs> a ton of things that I shouldn't even have been in the right room for, you know, just, and I went through a series of mistakes and uh, failures. But um, as I always say, it's only a failure when you stop. Up until that time, it's an education. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's so powerful. And I'm actually listening to your book right now. And, you know, the whole thing about you, like, going to Hong Kong and, you know, getting a job, you know, getting fired the next day. Like, I mean, just craziness. How did you transition from, like, this journey that you go on to kind of figure yourself out to being, speaking, and coaching and all this fun stuff? So when you fail a lot, you start asking the right questions, don't you? Right. And usually it's those questions, along with the education of the failure, that get you to where you need to be. Now, you mentioned Hong Kong. I wanted to get out of being poor, so I applied for a stockbroking job, got it in Hong Kong, flew over there, landed for one day, and was fired because I had no qualifications. <laughs> um, but that was the length that I was willing to go for. I was willing to change country, rip ties from my friends, my support system to try and find that bloody golden goose, to try and find that, hey, where am I at? And I, I failed at it again. Mm -hmm. And so it was that aggravation that got me thinking, where am I going wrong? I will travel the other side of the planet for a job opportunity. I will work, you know, 27 hours in a day. I'll do all of that. So why am I not getting it? So I actually went out not to, not to build up a concierge firm, not to become the most connected man to billionaires, not to pull off these fantastical things that you've heard about. I went out to ask a very successful person, why are you successful and I'm not? Because you must know the answer because you're successful. And so it became a Trojan horse. I thought to myself, if I can give you something that you want, and I could grab your attention via that, then I can pour an old fashioned and go, look, you got to tell me something here. Why are you successful? Or what keeps you up all night? Or how did you get here? So I started a journey to try and give, get myself that education. Without realizing it, 
I launched the world's leading experiential concierge firm from the late 90s, worked with billionaires all over the planet, um, did, did very well for myself in that concierge, concierge industry, but it was all for means to an end. And then three years ago, wrote a book um, because, you know, in your 50s, you know, I'm living up here in Los Angeles. I'm very comfortable now. Um, but I thought to myself, people are doing it wrong. People are focusing on the, the, the being articulate. Branding 101 is just horrible today. You know, be someone you're not. You know, all of that bullshit. Lean up against a car you don't own. That'll yeah. solve it. All of that shit. Yeah. So I thought to myself, I'm a, my wife calls me a Neanderthal. I'm basically a Neanderthal on a motorcycle that just turns up to a billionaire and gets them to wire him 750 grand to just pull a party off with no information. <laughs> so I put all of that into a book um, to be blunt, not thinking it would sell, but wanting to get my opinions out there. Um, and it took off. And as of this morning, I actually got told that it's just been released in Russia. So oh, nice. um, it's got translated and it's been released in Russian. So now it's in Polish, Korean, Mandarin, Thai, Vietnamese, obviously English. And um, because of that, I now coach and I speak on how to create impact without basically denting your bank balance. Yeah. Well, and I'm probably, I've been listening to the audiobook and I'm probably about an hour and a half into it and a great narrator there, whoever you got hired there, that's a, that's a great job there. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, like such a good book, people need to go and read this, pick this book up. Uh, one of the first things I noticed when I was on your homepage, though, is your quote is imperfections are your perfections. And man, I love this. It took me a long time to realize that. And I still try to, you know, figure that out at times, but can you go deep on what you mean by that? Yeah, it, it's funny. If you try to get a job in Silicon Valley, what do you do? You wear a hoodie and a, a ripped up pair of jeans, a, a shitty t-shirt that looks as though it's never been washed and a pair of uh, Converse sneakers. You try to fit in to the stereotype of Silicon Valley. If you want a job in Wall Street, you got to put a suit on and a red tie and, you know, be uh, you know, a bit more slick and stuff. But what you're doing is you're identifying with a community, but you're not standing out. And I realized later that my unicorn had been that I never branded myself. I just showed up. Now, here's the thing. Today, you've got to understand, we're pissed off as a community, as a nation, as a world's population. We're aggravated. And our tolerance level is really, really low. And I'll, I'll you know, I'll, Eric, I'll pick on you. You know, we're both smooth, salesy people. You know, we know how to sell someone down a funnel. When have you been in a room and someone's selling you and all of a sudden they're closing you and you feel yourself going down this funnel? Now, go back five years and you're like, this guy's slick. You know, that, that, that is a smooth ass close. Yeah, I'll buy your product. And right. you bought it. OK. And you've almost felt kind of like smiley because of the entertainment factor with the sale, you know? <laughs> Being in London, going down an East London market, and you come home with a bunch of steak knives and suddenly realize you're a vegan, but the guy was so smooth, you bought the steak knives. <laughs> don't. Now, today, we don't have that tolerance. Any moment now, someone can say something. We've been through racial hatred. We've been through you know, political upheaval. We've been through police, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, Asian hate. We're very, very, very pissed off and aggravate. And then to top it off, we've been like caged animals for a year where we haven't been able to go out. Yep. So today people don't want to be sold. So when they see a slick ass picture of you leaning up against a car that you rented for the day for the photo shoot, wearing a suit that you would ne not, not normally wear and trying, this is the bad thing, trying to act so articulate and pompous and overcomplicated. The smartest people in the planet can explain to you splitting the atom in a way that you could go and tell a mate in a pub. Yep. It's those people that don't understand that stuff that overcomplicate it. How many times do you hear, well, I'd like to explain it, but you know, you, you, you wouldn't understand. It would take too long. <laughs> That's always said by people that can't explain it. Right. So I noticed that I was me. I showed up as me. It became refreshing. And then I was like, why am I getting so much business when the guy next to me that's just pulled up in the Ferrari looking like he's just come out of Miami Vice? How come he's not walking away with a deal when I've just turned up 
with an old motorcycle and walked into the building with a crash helmet. Right. It's because, and here's the key for anyone listening, I was transparent. I was impossible to misunderstand. Uh, understand. You love me, you hate me, but you can make a decision really quick. I've got no one sitting on the fence. Even in this podcast, there are people that are going, I like this guy. Or there are people that are going, that guy's a prick. I want nothing to do with him. But I'm not. I've not got people that are going, I don't understand this guy. I'm not sure where he's coming from. Because I'm not breeding that confusion and a confused prospect will never give you that credit card. So I think that's when I realized that actually being big, ugly, inarticulate, can't spell for shit. Uh, Jay Abraham, a friend of mine, said, I've got a greater I can than an IQ. Not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm not confusing. And that's what I had on my side. Oh, I love it. <laughs> That's so good. And even like with the folks that you coach, the first two questions that you say you ask is what's the problem and why is that a problem? You know, yeah. those are such important questions. Is there a common theme that you hear from folks when you ask those questions? There's a, there's a common theme I hear about it from affluent people that got okay. me to that point. You see, okay. the affluent people, they, they, they get a squeaky wheel on a wheelbarrow and the, the normal person, the unsuccessful mind, straight away goes to the wheel and goes, well, I've got to grease it. You know, I've got to repair that wheel, okay? The successful person turns around and says, when was the last time I used a wheelbarrow? Do I need that wheelbarrow? Does that wheelbarrow need to be here? Is it more cost effective to actually employ someone at the time to come in and do the work? So I've now got him and his wheelbarrow. Why is the problem there? Let's look at that first before we start fixing something. The amount of people that actually have things in their house that they fixed and still never used it. <laughs> so successful people, they focus on the problem rather than the solution and first ask themselves, what is the problem there in the first place? Mm. You know, Elon Musk invented electric cars. Friction-based engines wear out because that combustion, that based on friction, how do you make an engine last forever? It's easy. Create something that doesn't need it. And that's what he did. So I noticed from people that they never looked at the solution. They never did. They first looked at the problem and got to the core of the problem. So now when I coach people and they're like, well, I've been trying this. It's not working. I need to do more of it. You're like, look, if you punch yourself in the head twice, it doesn't matter if you do it another 10 times. It's still the same effect. So you've <laughs> got to start focusing on what's new. And let's be blunt. We're, we're now happily in a year where we're coming out of COVID. Last year was a different year. We can all agree on that. In fact, the whole world can agree on that. We're never going to go back to what people think is normal. What we know today will be different to what we're doing in six months' time. AI is coming. Electric cars are coming. So much is happening that you've got to be ready to adapt and move and change. So stop looking at the problem or stop looking to solve the problem and focus on the problem itself. And that's what I do with my coaching clients. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I believe action is the foundation of success. With strategic action, your vision can become a thriving reality. However, in today's modern age, you will need world-class digital infrastructure designed around the goal of your business. At Vision Thrive, we specialize in creating websites, e-commerce sites, and mobile apps for your business. When you work with us, we have a no questions asked refund policy, so you're guaranteed to like what you see. If you're interested, please visit visionthrive.com. That's V-I-S-I-O-N-T-H-R-I-V-E.com. Look, this is perfect for every entrepreneur and MMA fighter out there. Again, take a look at visionthrive.com. And then... Uh, like we talked earlier, I'm, I'm listening to your audiobook right now, but your book is called Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. And you've also had the company for many, many years. For those who don't know, what is blue fishing and what's that journey that you're taking folks on through this book? So, as I said, I needed a reason to get in front of uh, affluent people. So what yeah. I did was I noticed that affluent people wanted experiences. So I became the guy that enabled was able to put on those experiences by doing more than what they asked me for. I have a saying, never give a client what they ask for, give them what they lust and desire. Mm -hmm. Okay. So someone would say to me, Hey, I want to, I want a really cool meal in Florence. Get me a good restaurant. Nope. 
I shut down the Academia, the Galleria, the private museum that houses Michelangelo's David, set a table of six up at the feet of David. Halfway through their meatballs, I brought in Andrea Bocelli for the uh, dinnertime entertainment. So I take things that you ask and I go nuts on them. I go for the ridiculous, the stupid. How can I take your request and just go with it? And that's what I did. But all the way along, I wanted to ask questions. So I had Bluefish, which was the name of my concierge firm that did all of these kind of things. But Bluefishing became the mentality behind it. So when the book came out, it was just it just made sense to call it Bluefishing, the art of making things happen. Yeah. Because it was what I discovered affluent people need, lust and desire for. And then the lessons that they actually taught me along the way by me being able to ask them the blunt questions. Why are you rich and I'm not? Why are you successful and I'm not? What keeps you up at night? How does your head change? What do you see as different between you and someone that's not successful? And that was the whole way through it. I love that. And I, I selfishly started my podcast because I wanted to ask those questions. So folks like yourself and Ed Milet and Shen, Sean Whalen and all these guys, right? Like, sure. why are they doing these awesome things? And I'm still sitting here, you know, working at my nine to five, which I'm blessed, but like, it's not my passion. My passion was this talking to amazing people like yourself. And, and, uh, you know, you have this awesome podcast called the art of making things happen. You and I have had some shared guests on there from Greg Reed and Chris Rudin, Sean Whalen, and, you know, Zach Babcock there. I always curious to ask other podcasts. What's your favorite part about podcasting? Well, let's be serious. Podcast, podcast is a brilliant carrot, isn't it? You know, we didn't have yeah. podcasts. If I had had podcasts back in the in the eighties and nineties, then I wouldn't have launched a concierge firm because I was trying to engage rich people to have the conversation that me and you are having now. So podcasts are a brilliant way of dangling the carrot to people, going, "Hey, I can get you greater exposure." But let's be blunt. Again, it's a Trojan horse. You just want to have a half hour conversation with someone that's maybe doing stuff that you're not. So that's the same for me. I want to interview people that are doing things differently. You know, you mentioned Waylon on there. You know, I've had Sean on there. I've had Naveen Jan. I've had prostitutes, priests, lifers. I want to get people on there that I want to ask questions and go, hey, you went through this but it didn't own you. You owned it and you became this. Yes. What was the twist? You know, and I've been, I've been able to gather so much information. So do I, I, I never, someone said to me the other day, they went, Oh, what's your download rate? <laughs> yeah. Two, two answers. One don't know. Second one don't care. Yep. I'm having conversations with people that I want to have conversations with. Hopefully there's others out there that are, I know there are, but I'm never going to be the guy that goes, hey, brought to you by Gillette, brought to you by bourbon whiskey. You know, I don't want to sponsor it out. I don't want to monetize it. I don't want to change the beast that it is. Yep. Oh, it's so good. So good. Yeah, I'm the same way. You know, I came from the broken house, you know, broken household. You know, fought my mom's boyfriend at 13. I was in jail at 18, bankrupt at 21. And 16 years sober now, like crazy, crazy life. And I had to flip that switch and decide like my past does not define my future. And I can continue to make that change at any point. And, and uh, man, just, it's been an awesome journey over the last 16 years being married to my best friend and man, it's uh, so good. But like, yeah, like you said, man, our, our past, we can just get rid of that. We can start over at any point we decide to do that on. What is well, the key? To just oh, just on that point there, just on that point there, I was taught many, many years ago that what you went through isn't there to define you, it's there to refine you. Yes. So you, my friend, got an MBA, a bachelor's and a PhD, just in different arenas has now landed you here. Had you uh, stopped and gone, well, I'm a criminal. Oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm this, I'm a drunk, I'm this. Then it would have defined you. Yep. But at the time, these were challenges that were put out there to refine your character that's brought you to where you are today. Yes. Oh, that's so good. I hadn't heard that one before. That's, that's excellent. What is the key to getting what you want out of life? Oh, fuck me. Yeah. So easy. Ask for it. I knew you were going to say that. So now I wanted to ask the, that. That's the daft thing. <laughs> yeah. So many people today base what they go for on people that are inadequate around them. How yes. many people go down to the pub and they go, right, hey, I'm going to start a software business and I'm going to do this. And you get all the people around them drinking their beers going, oh, you could never do that. That could never happen. And what's the mistake? 
you listen to them. Yeah. You listen to these people that can't afford more than two beers a night. Those are the people that you value their opinion. You need to get people in your room that challenge your expectations, challenge what you demand of yourself and ask for it. There is a, there's a story and I'll make it pretty brief, but I had this client and I've already, I've already told a little bit about it, but yeah. I had a client that wanted uh, a dining experience in Florence. Very, very powerful guy. I've already given the end bit away, but I took over the Academia de Galleria Museum, closed it from three o'clock in the afternoon till two o'clock in the morning, set up an amazing table at the feet of Michelangelo's David, the most iconic statue in the planet. And then at nine o'clock at night, my clients entered their own private museum, had dinner from a top Tuscan shelf, a chef, and then they had Andrea Bocelli come in and serenade them. Now that's fantastic. That's the shit that I do. But here's a story that a lot of people don't know, which I'm going to impart for you. I use, I use powerful people. You know, if you change the room you're in, amazing things happen. So I knew some people that were connected that allowed me to get to this museum. But once I got the powers to be to say yes, they delegated me down to the curator to actually make it happen. Now, the curator is an employee of the museum. They don't own it. They're not millionaires. They are art fans, okay? And, and, and professors and geniuses, they're, they're great people, but they're not the money people, okay? So during the event, and I had two days to put this together, two days. So I was saying, hey, we need the piano to come in, you know, put a piano at the feet of this big statue in a museum, need the piano to come in, be here at six o'clock tomorrow, so we need the back doors open. This guy turned around to me and he went, uh, yeah, I will see what I can do. Now, with the people that I was dealing with, both the people that had got me the museum, the people that were coming in to enjoy the museum, the money that was uh, changing hands, I want a little bit more than I will see what I can do. I don't want a bloody piano on the streets of Florence sitting there waiting for someone to open up the freaking door. Yeah. So then I said to him, oh, and the chef's coming here at seven. I need this section opened up and I'll need the kitchen opened up. He responded with, yeah, yeah, it should be okay. <laughs> For two days, that was the most enthusiasm I got out of him. And he was winding me up. So come the night of it, it's Wednesday night. I'm in, I'm in the academia. I'm stood next to Veronica Bocelli. Andrea Bocelli is with his son moving the piano around, retuning it, and wobbling, trying to find out the best play for, place for him to be able to serenade the clients without too much reverb from the marble. And the chef's setting up the, uh, uh, the tables and everything's looking good. And this curator was leaning up against the wall with his arms crossed. Now, this prick had bothered me for two days running. And I thought to myself, very immature. I'm going to give you that in advance. But he needed a slap. He needed kind of like to be put in his place that you kind of try to drag me through it, fella. You know, that was silly. So I called him over and he came over to me and his arms crossed. He's got his cravat and he's got his uh, waistcoat and dapper Italian gentleman. God, he was maybe, I'm 245 pound of ugly and he's maybe 160 pound if he's wet, okay. you know? <laughs> So there's this little Italian fella next to me, and I'm literally looking a little bit down to him because yeah. he was shorter than me. And I went, look at that table. Is that not the most beautiful table you have ever seen? And he, he doesn't even look at me. He's like, yeah, it is beautiful. It is fantastic. Apologize about the accent, but stick with it for ambience. And um, I said, look at that table. Look at the view it's got. The iconic statue of David, the most iconic statue in the planet, more famous than any other statue in the world. Is that not the most beautiful view for an Italian meal? And he's like, oh, it is, it is incredible, it is fantastic. I said, now whoa up a bit. We've got the maestro himself, the icon of Italian music, Andrea Bocelli. He's gonna serenade our clients while they're chewing their pasta. Is that not just incredible? He's like, no, that is, is fantastic. It is wonderful. And I went, so hold up a minute. How do you think I managed to pull it off? Now, at this moment in time, I was expecting, 
No one's as connected as you. No one's as smooth as you. No one's as good looking as you. Any of those would have pacified my ego. Yeah. But the guy just looked at me for the first time during this entire conversation. And he said, no one's ever asked. Killed me. I literally folded over and I, I came back up again to see this little shit just smiling at me because he knew he'd got me. Now, I don't mention his name because he's become a dear friend and we you know, see each other on a regular basis. But <laughs> the point was, it taught me a valuable lesson. I demanded this of myself. I wanted this. So what did I do? I went out and I asked for a shock horror surprise. I got it. Now, we don't always get what we ask for, but we never get what we don't. So I actually flew back and I was thinking about all of the amazing things that I had done. And I made a list of them all on the plane back to here in LA. And I went through like a six month journey of phoning people up to rekindle relationships going, Hey, do you remember when we did this? And Oh my God, we did this with the rock band. And do you remember when we did this with Elton John? How come I managed to do it? The answer actually came out the exact same every single time because you asked Steve. Yes. And I realized two things. We don't ask for as much as we want. And we ask less for ourselves. I am asking myself today to be better than I was yesterday. I am asking myself to earn more, to create more impact, to do more, to be a decent podcast guest. I'm asking myself to be that. But if we don't ask, it does not happen. Yes. Oh, that's so good. I knew you were going to say that. And that's so true. I'm the same way. I always just have to ask. I, you know, I have two podcasts, the other, you know, show I talk about MMA fighters. I always get punched in the face. Why do they want to do that? And it goes the same with the entrepreneurs, right? We get punched in the face. Hopefully it's not physically, but all the nose rejections, but we have to keep going, keep asking the question to get what we want. I love that. So good. Now, I mean, you've done so, so much unbelievable stuff. You've worked with unbelievable people. You've got money, you've got success. What is it that excites you today? Impact. Impact. I noticed that uh, the, the richer you get, and I don't want to be crude, but the, the, the more money you get, the more you start looking at the impact it can create. Yeah. You know, um, I actually, uh, the book came out, which allowed me to kind of like disrupt people's thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do that through, you know, my speakeasy events and my Sims distillery. My, my, that's my online community, shallow plug there. Um, but I like to disrupt people. I like to get them uncomfortable. And three years ago, I was invited to Kern Prison. Um, and you don't go to Kern because you've got a parking ticket. It's a level four maximum security uh, prison. Um, and I got invited to go there. And I went there truthfully, because I thought it would challenge me. It would be a cool story. It would kind of elevate my street cred. You know, Sims is in prison for the, all of that kind of shit. Yeah. And it blew me away. And I have been in black tie events in Beverly Hills. And I noticed something about the people that I was with in Kern and the people that I was with in Beverly Hills was that a lot of the people in Beverly Hills just ain't been caught yet. Mm. You know, and, you know, they were well tailored crooks that sure. I wouldn't trust with my dog. But I started going back to this prison. I've been doing it for three years now. In fact, I charge, you're going to love this. I charge $500 to go to prison with me. Okay. okay? <laughs> Most people would pay 500 bucks not to go to prison, but I charge 500 bucks. It goes directly to the charity. So it doesn't go through me. So you get a tax write off. Yeah. But we take about 40 entrepreneurs into prison to meet people that some of them had like, you know, $10 million businesses, but of course they were illegal. So they know how to run a business. <laughs> they know about marketing. They know about branding. They just did it in an illegal format. And it challenges people to listen to people's other perspectives. You know, there's a bottom line about it. You, you've got a, a zip code lottery. If you're in a bad neighborhood and you're surrounded and saturated by that, and maybe your family's already cocooned in that, then the odds are already against you. Does it make you a bad person or are you now just a product of where you were? So it allows us to go in there and to meet people that have actually gone, hey, this happened and I own it. 
and uh, I've apologized for it. I own it. I respect it, but it's not me. It's what I did, but it's not me. And when you can actually meet people that in that kind of environment can change their mentality, then you're already out of excuses. So for now, I like to do things to get people a bit uncomfortable. I like to disrupt their way. I like to disrupt the way they're thinking. And we joke about creative disruptors, which is what I propose to, uh, to a lot of people to be. And I like them to be able to look at what they're doing. Again, stop looking at the solution, look at why the problem's there in, 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 in the first place, and then create something that is direct impact. You don't have to be pretty. A hammer ain't the sharpest tool in the shed, but it can create major impact when used properly. So that's what really excites me now. So, so awesome. So awesome. Steve, such an honor to have you on my show. Thank you for taking time and sharing your story. You are an absolute world changer, man. Really excited to meet you later this year. And thank you again for your time, man. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much for watching the show today. I appreciate it. If you could please leave a rating and review on our Apple podcast. The link is down below. That helps us get our message out, get the show out, helps us get ranked out there on the Apple podcast. Also leave a comment below, man. I'd love to know what part of this show made the most impact on you. I respond to every comment on there and please share this video, whether you're watching on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, please share it out. We want to make sure that we impact as many people as we can with the guests that come on my show and highlight those guests and what they've got going on and they're changing the world. So thank you so much for the time. So appreciate it. Have an awesome day.